This is the Neo Books call for Monday, February 5th, 2024. Um, turning on captions. And we're all set. How is everybody? Um, Californians, are you like wearing fins outside? Are you good? You're all right? <laughs> You're pretty light over here. I'm in Palm, Palm Springs Immunity. area. And uh, we were getting some rain, but the the real uh, downpour is on the coastline. Yeah, uh, there were April was in Santa Barbara for a talk last week, <clears throat> and uh, or week before last, and there like major photos of flooding everywhere, and you know, yeah, crazy. I was expecting it to rain in San Diego. I think it sprinkled a little bit, but it hasn't really started yet. It hasn't hit you. I think that the the wave made a u-turn and sort of turned back up and really slammed mm -hmm. into the coast about just above you <clears throat> something like that it looked yeah. like yeah. a looked like a starry night painting san diego is up this evening you are it's coming just <laughs> <laughs> oh great <laughs> it keeps shifting back i you know first i think it was sunday and then monday and then now tuesday dave witzel what is the no network <clears throat> i don't think i've seen it either this is something Brad DeGraff is working on with oh. like Day Waterbury and I don't know, a few other folks in there. I'm still grokking it, but uh, trying to map the people who are thinking about regeneration and then map them by bioregion. Uh -huh. uh, and then they're using, awesome. I thought, some interesting tools. And they I think they've been scraping LinkedIn. So they have kind of a, you know, it's like a rich enough database so you can kind of play with it. Um, What's it called, Dave? It's in the link in the chat there. Who knows? Or let me put it. I can put it. Yeah. In Who knows? Collaborative yeah. mapping of global regional expertise. Yeah, yeah. Global okay. regeneration expertise. Sorry, I misread that. Okay. Um, we'll have to get these folks talking to Vincent. Yeah, I think maybe they are. I don't know. I'm always a little confused over who's talking to who, but. Uh, um, and then it's just you know because I've always wondered it's like you know if you could if you could just get into the back end of LinkedIn right it seems like you could do so many amazing things with it and you know they just close you out of but I've, this is uh, like I've seen some people doing that I think it might have been this call anyway there was there was a, a a few people doing a semi back end of LinkedIn thing that's kind of interesting I would love I would love a social graph for my LinkedIn network. Right. Well, and wouldn't you want to see it in the you know, like? I would love to see the social graph of the regeneration network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, well, uh, and yeah. they could probably draw a bunch of it. It'd be great to have sub logic. You know, logical operators on the whole thing. Show me the people who are in OGM and the regeneration network. And Bing, there you go. Well, they don't, to, they don't want. They don't want to let us do that. Well, they, uh, so. LinkedIn zealously protects its social graph, doesn't let people crawl it, uh, does a whole bunch of stuff, but then they don't offer power tools themselves, which is like, hey, stupid, like you should do this. Why don't we offer them some power tools? That'd be good. And then that funds the OGM for the rest of forever. The rest of forever is nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, we had said last week, that we would, we started a conversation on collective authoring and we said, hey, let's pick that up and keep going next week, which is now. I think the topic is awesome uh, and juicy and fruitful for our various collective efforts, I think, because we're trying to figure out how to create shared meaning, how to propagate ideas, how to involve people in different ways uh, from peripheral likes and thumbs ups to deep, you know, collaborative editing to shared manuscripts to whatever else. Um, and I would love, uh, Pete, I don't know if you have a, a starting point for the conversation that you wanted to sort of posit as a, as a place to go from. Uh, but I was, I was thinking maybe we could do a, a go around and see what, uh, what questions everybody's got about collective authoring that we should address, for example. But Pete, if you want to and Stacy, go ahead. I was just going to say that I left the call last week thinking that I wish there was a word other than collective authoring. That <laughs> That's a great to start. Like, <laughs> because it's sort of like combination of collective editing 
and synthesizing. And I think having the right word would be more inviting to participants. That is a terrific way to start the call. Um, Pete has his hand up. Please jump in. I was I was going to say something similar but different. Maybe maybe different but similar. I don't know. Um, I I wish we had a taxonomy of collective authoring or whatever. Um, partly because I found out there were a lot many more kinds in in discussion last week. I found out that there were many more kinds than you know I had previously thought, uh, ranging all the way from we're typing on the same page at the same time or typing on the same page at different times or you know out to yeah um, i i offered authored a book collectively i have uh, a chapter she has a chapter uh, he has a chapter um, and all of those things you know if we call those all collective authoring then i well we need to we need to i i would dig in and like define all those and then talk about the individual ones and having said that, the thing that, that most interests me is wiki style collective authoring, uh, which is asynchronous uh, co-editing. Um, and um, that's, that's where a lot of my energy is and, and I, where I would like to see more. And then that reminds me, we, we left, I, I left with the assertion that, oh, it's easy and fun um, and productive to do that. And, um, and it, it's, um, it was counterintuitive how that even works. You know, like, what do you mean? You everybody edited the page, and yet nobody claimed credit for the page. That doesn't make any sense. the The realization I had right after the call was, uh, it's easy and fun when people have shared goals. Um, and in the old wiki days, usually the shared goal was let's make the information space. Uh, as as good as possible and let's make each page as good as possible and when everybody shares that goal it's, it's easy to go in and edit a page with with some more heuristics and and discussion around that but not much it's really really easy to go into a page and say oh i'm going to make some changes in the spellings or oh there's another paragraph or two i could add or or oh um, I need to have, to have a whole section where this is actually a subject that has some debate and, and uh, you know, diegesis. And, I, and, um, and let me organize it so that there's the, you know, the pro, con, pro side and the con side and the neutral side and, and, and like that. So, um, so then, of course, all of that is easy when you have shared goals. And then getting to shared goals is never that easy. Um, so then the flip side, the reason why we publish books, um, uh, edited, I forget what, we, what the, the term was, but edited volumes. The reason why we, we, we do edit volumes is because the goal that we could agree to is let's publish a book together. And then we didn't go into any more de depth than that. You know, I want to say what I want to say. I want to say it my way. I don't want you know, them involved in the way I say it. And I certainly don't want to mess their stuff up. So I'm going to stay in my chapter. They'll stay in their chapter. So that, that to me is a tragedy. Um, so there you go. Um, awesome, Pete. Thank you. Great start. Uh, Klaus, then Gil. Yeah, so I'm I'm taking a turn, not 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 from from the, my thinking or so, but maybe uh, the the way and uh, I've been looking at this. Um, there is a shift in the way that AI is being deployed, um, because particularly with Chat GPT Enterprise coming online, and the way and the way the way this works is that. Uh, companies are now developing a proprietary form of AI and ChatGPT Enterprise allows that by uh, um, uh, protecting the um, intellectual property that companies are developing. And so the shared the learning is not shared with the platform, but it is staying within that frame. So we, we just... Uh, um, we just made contact with, uh, we developed this networking meeting and there are several medium-sized companies in, engaged here. There's, I mean, they are in the millions of revenue, but like uh, eight digit maybe um, revenues. And so 
uh, these companies just don't have a lot of the resources they would need to really broaden out mm -hmm. and uh, and connect uh, across platforms and exchange information efficiently. You know? and, and AI is uh, um, filling an, an enormously important gap here. And so I tested, uh, so I'm in the process of setting up an AI for one of these companies and they, they are subcontracted with Siemens. So they are pretty loaded, you know, they have, uh, they have uh, resources. And when I started uh, a training process, you know, for uh, that particular AI, for this particular company, you realize that this AI really doesn't know doesn't know a thing when you first start. You know, you're really dealing with a blank sheet of paper. And then you have to fill in what you want the AI to know in order to deal with questions for that particular company within their frame of reference. You know, the things they're working on, the tools they need, you know, the relationships they have and need to build and so on and so on. That is incredibly powerful. My son, you know, you, uh, my son works for Samsara. He's the head of talent branding for for Samsara. That's what they do. They are now getting into ChatGPT enterprise, you know, and this is a, a, I mean, they just passed a billion dollars in revenue. So that's a significant company. So that's how AI is being deployed. I look at NeoBooks as a training tool, you know, for uh, specialized AI. So, so the information in volume one, for example, now coming up in volume two, really is an iteration of uh, things you need to know to really engage uh, in a in a meta level uh, perspective uh, within the food and agriculture you know, uh, uh, markets in the sector of the economy. So that's where I'm at. It, it's uh, it, it's it's really what does AI need to know in order to address complex issues? You know, where you are asking for advice and for help to to reach across you know vast amounts of data and and bring it together. And so each time I'm asking a question in the AI that I have set up, the original AI that I used to develop the Neobox, uh, I get, you know, I ask a question, I expect maybe 20% of what comes back. The rest, 80% is added perspectives that I wouldn't have thought of on my own, simply by the way the AI contextualizes the information. So, so that's sort of more um, the direction I've been taking. I think there is an amazing business opportunity in developing an AI and then make and then putting a user interface in front of it. You know, so you can have the AI uh, in your in your uh, fold. You put an interface into the front of it uh, that that uh, you know, gets you through a query and and through. Um, through uh, a customization process, which then allows the use uh, for for your clients or for your you know, that you can develop. That's that's sort of my my thought process at this time. Um, thanks, Klaus. Just to connect that back to collective authoring, I I'm in, I'm sort of reading part of what you said as how do we collaborate with the AIs as part of the collective authoring participants in that sense, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, then the question is ownership, right? I mean, who really developed this thing and who owns it? And, uh, um, you know, because you are, I mean, this this has to be a commercial enterprise, right? I mean, it has to be a revenue generating enterprise because it, you will need resources, you will need to pay people and so on. But the potential is massive. You know? I mean, in the food business, for example, uh, there is this this thing right now where they're talking about low carbon intensity scores. So the biofuel industry is getting incentivized uh, to have uh, to have farmers uh, grow uh, feedstock for biofuel in ways that reduces their carbon intensity, and they develop a scoring system to do that. 
Um, and based on the, the lowest possible score, I mean, they're starting maybe at 35, you know, whatever that score means. And then uh, this one guy is saying, well, I was able to bring it down to minus five. And so he gets a premium for his crop. Well, well, that's a fantastic idea. And this is the and the government put money behind it. There's a bill, C, uh, E41, whatever it's called, uh, where the government is actually funding this, right? So that's already in place. It got snuck in without anybody knowing it. None of the NGOs even saw this coming. Well, why don't we take this one step further and develop a nutrient intensity score? Because the same core data can allow you to extrapolate nutrient density. Um, then you can communicate with consumers of saying, this has a nutrient level index A, B, C, or whatever. You know, so by doing that, it's a complete game changer because now the public is becoming aware you know, that there is a link between soil health and nutrient density and nutrient health, which means gut health. So, but you need, you would need an AI supported tool because, uh, you know, uh, in order to make this affordable and cost effective for smaller farmers. That's just one example, one example in my space, right? In the, uh, in the, the sector of the economy, there is so much opportunity in deploying AI in ways that it's just completely going to be a game changer. Thanks, Klaus. As we go into this, a thing maybe we I could ask you to focus on is, <clears throat> in what different ways would other participants in your ecosystem, in the conversations you're having and the things kind of that you want to do, how would they want to interact with the information you're providing? Just as readers, as audience, or as co-authors, as as commenters, as critics, as whatever else, like what what are those, what are those the types or qualities of those interactions? Because that will dictate a piece of of what we're looking at on on how do we how do we author? Because to me, a comment is is that's a, that's also authoring, you know, commenting on a work even though it seems like it's outside the work uh, is also uh, interesting. And and I think we're trying to facilitate your publishing a lot of things so that they look like a sub, you know, so that they're Substack pubs, you're doing uh, podcast sort of things. All those things are, are elements of, of collectively authoring in some way. Uh, Gil? Yeah. Um, um, yes to the enormous potential. I wonder if anybody's asked the AIs about the ways we can use the, use the AIs. Um, Klaus, to your point on soils, I was stunned to hear the Secretary of State talking about the importance of soils in global sustainability and regeneration strategy. It's kind of remarkable that it's penetrated to there. Uh, I just wanted to comment real quickly on the thing Pete said a while ago. I think it was Pete who said about a taxonomy of neo-bookie approaches. I know in the, you know, in the in the stack of projects that I'm looking at, there are very different levels of collaboration. I'm looking to run different projects. Some are, you know, like everybody on the keyboard together. Uh, writing in a document. Some are collect an anthology collecting pieces from different writers. Some are uh, having open public comments and editing revision uh, of, 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 of books or chapters. And so I think that taxonomy would be really helpful, both for our workings, but also for the invitations we're making out to other people. That's all. Thanks, Gil. In the early days of groupware, there was a little two by two matrix that was synchronous, asynchronous, in person, <clears throat> virtual. I think that those were the two matrices. Pete, you'll, does that ring a bell from back in the day? And everybody, you know, people used to sort of say, oh, okay, so forums and discussions are asynchronous over here and not in person. And then like real meetings are in person, et cetera. Uh, I think we need a more elaborate, uh, more interesting, more useful version of something like that, probably. Um, other thoughts on the puzzle? More, more, more refined than fit for purpose, because our purpose here is different than what that was back in the day. Yeah, that was just a really simple attempt to differentiate between various kinds of groupware where nobody understood the term. It yeah. was just a, a first cut at uh, at how do we do this. Um, Dave says uh, perfect modularization. Yeah, yes, totally agree. Uh, we've talked about nuggetization. Then we had a side discussion about hey, is the word nugget the right word? Uh, we have not replaced it quite yet, but but the whole idea of if we want people to participate a lot, how do we create modular reusable uh, media, okay. right? That that in, that enhances that kind of participation. Because you know, if you publish a book, the way people participate in books is they write reviews and post those separately. 
or they send the author a, a comment or a critique or a correction or whatever else. That's a, that's a really blunt, not very collaborative way of, of creating ideas and sharing ideas. Other thoughts? Um, so yeah, I'm still getting my head around where you guys are going with this. Um, and so my, my question really, I guess, is around why, like, why are we doing this? Um, and so for me to answer that question, the idea of a a new way of creating content that isn't uh, for the purpose of creating content, but for the, the purpose of knowledge, uh, which are two different things. Nowadays, most of the content we create has nothing to do with knowledge. Um, and, and how do we create knowledge in the way that is, um, that is open meaning it's not my knowledge or my view of things, but a, a bit of knowledge that I have that I I think has some legs and I'll put it out there. Um, and uh, I don't feel ownership of it. I just want it to be out there and for others to uh, validate or improve or do whatever it is that, that needs to happen. And, and how do I, how do we build a foundational piece of information that that people can add to because every book we write every book we read every book is is just you know it's 90 percent fluff for lack of a better way to put it um we're filling in you know the 300 pages we need to fill in and then you know there's maybe four or five good ideas in it. Um, the ideas often get lost in the book and, um, you know, get characterized as somebody's idea when it, in reality, whoever wrote the book probably talked to a thousand different people to come up with those ideas in the first place. Um, and so for me, it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how we have a different way of looking at knowledge information and how we take it to a, a new way of publishing. And I don't even think that that's the right word, uh, a new way of disseminating this information that is truly open. Um, so that, that to me is, that's what I would define as my why. Does that kind of relate to what you guys are talking about? It's a very different space where are we i'm totally on uh and I'm, i'll take a swing at answering it uh i just described the traditional process of how books get in the world and how people respond reply to books why you know publishing a a review or commentary or whatever or maybe there's a place for a, a comment thread on a bullet board somewhere where the author is or something like that um we we're using massive wiki to create the Neo books in part because <clears throat> the massive wiki is built on out of markdown files on GitHub and GitHub buys us version control and community editing, collaborative editing, and a bunch of other stuff. But two of the big wins with GitHub are that every version, every change that, that gets submitted gets kept. And there are several different formats for collaboration inside of GitHub. Uh, fork and pull is the most famous one, which means you can go look at a repo fork it to your own uh, workspace, make a change, and then suggest a change which the original author can pull into the main line, or you can fork and wander off and just do something entirely different with it, et cetera, et cetera. And those are, they're baked into the platform we've, that Pete has chosen as a starting point, and they're pretty geeky. So they're not like what muggles use every day. Muggles are used to going on AOL and typing into a forum or a comment thread or something like that. And that's, that's a piece of how they interact, which is, evanescent. It's fleeting. It, it, it goes away. 
you could easily imagine a whole bunch of different ways, probably way too many ways to add interaction, interactivity, reusability to a nugget like uh, a markdown file on a GitHub repo. Uh, you could connect that nugget to Hypothesis, which is an open source uh, comments engine that preserves URLs for the comments and allows you to be part of a community that's basically building ideas across works inside of Hypothesis. We're fans of Hypothesis, but don't really use it. Uh, Massive Wiki is, is wired to actually prompt Hypothesis to show up so that you could go use it and make comments on a page. That would work fine. We could attach and implement a comment system like Discus, D-I-S-Q-U-S, or Discourse, which is a threaded forum discussion board. We had a Discourse server early in OGM. Uh, we, could, we could create some other form of more organized comments that go. Or we could rely on wiki sociality, which is where Pete was pointing early when he said it's really important to uh, to have, agree on on like why uh, agree on purpose. Why are we doing this, and what are our intentions here? And what makes a good wiki good is that social agreement, because otherwise everybody just does whatever the heck they want, and the wiki kind of falls apart. But a, a good wiki uh, winds up setting up some norms, practices, and then templates or or sort of rhythms that make the wiki as it grows and as more people contribute still really vital and interesting and, and big and good. And so a piece of what Neobooks is counting on is some piece of wiki sociality and wiki dynamics, which are its own little thing. Wiki dynamics are really different from using hypothesis, are really different from blogging and using TikTok and uh, you know doing duos on TikTok, for example, which is another form of commenting and collaborating, right? Um, so I think uh, what Gil is like, well, how do these all fit in a taxonomy? I, I'm interested in that as well. I don't think we're frozen in place without a taxonomy, but I think the number of options that we have is too many. And we need to figure out, are there different contexts in which certain better certain options are better than others? Which ones do we want to start with? We're sort of starting with a few by default because we're doing markdown files on GitHub. So by default, there's a couple of things right there that, that uh, we fall into. Um, but I think that's the, we're doing this because we want to, for, we want to create the thing you were saying on our last call, which is what's interesting here really is not the book. It's the, the lively discussions in a community that keeps improving the resources that it has. So where we, where we end up learning how to share ideas and improve those ideas. Absolutely dead on that, that, that's the thing. Now, the question is, you could imagine having six people collaborate with you on co-authoring the text of a nugget. It's really hard to imagine 6,000 people or 600,000 people doing that. So where do you put the gates, the filters? Um, whom do you let where? Uh, these are all just variables and it's all just software. Uh, there was a company called Mixed Ink. I'll put a link in the chat in a moment. Uh, there was a company called Mixed Ink that went away, but they had uh, a piece of software that would actually let a bunch of people collaboratively edit a document. And at the end, when, when you saw the finished document, you could trace which phrase came from which original author. So as everybody cut copy pasted, if whatever they kept preserved the original owner of the original uh, writer of that little stretch of, of the document. Very interesting. It was like an idea posing as a company. They died pretty quickly, I think. But the idea was kind of cool. And I have not, I have not seen anybody emulate them Although you could back into that information from the GitHub version control, et cetera, et cetera. You could, you could you know, reconstitute that feature if you thought that feature was really important to have. Um, there's also things like uh, Eric Eugene Kim created purple numbers. I think it was him on wikis so that you could actually have sort of paragraph or sentence level addressability inside a wiki. Instead of saying this page, you could say this paragraph on this page. Even that's a really interesting affordance. So, sorry, riffing on a whole bunch of different things, but the plate is set richly for modes. It's, it hasn't proven to be easy or contagious to do this well yet online, even though we're kind of all online doing something all the time. Instead, we're busy writing in uh, on email threads where every post just disappears into the bit bucket, basically, is my thought. So. Sorry, Pete, I went on longer than I expected to, but I hope Jose that that um, helps flesh out why. And and every time you say something, it's very funny to me. You're like, gosh, I hope that sounds like it's orthogonal to what you guys are doing, but I hope it's sort of in the picture. And I'm like, no, 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 you just described exactly our mission. Um, so uh, back to you in the booth, Pete, and then Rick. You're still muted.
Thanks. Yep. Um, before I go, I wonder, Jose, does does that trigger anything? What Jerry went through, or have any questions, or it it um, it triggers uh, that we're we're playing with the technology, and I'm wondering if we need to play more with the the needs. <laughs> um, that that's what triggers for me. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand all that at the technological level. I I, yeah. I understand most of it, but not necessarily all of it. But um, but I think those are just ways of doing things, and I don't think that that's really the the issue. There are lots of ways of the, doing these things, but I think it's what's the model of the thing we want to do that is going to answer the the why question that to me is and then the technology will come about but but until i understand a model i'm still i still just see a whole bunch of hammers all over the place and us trying to, to nail a bunch of stuff and i don't know exactly what it is that we're nailing yeah it makes a ton of sense um isn't it interesting how often we all take turns saying something instead of taking turns and asking a question. Um, uh, I was actually going to say something kind of similar, Jose. Um, for, for better or for worse, one of, the, one, of, one of the things that we do, especially Jerry and I, is talk a lot about tools. Um, and you're right. The, uh, it, it's, it's actually it's a chicken and egg thing because there are certain tools that that we know about that enable something that's actually pretty easy to do that is impossible to think about unless you started doing it so wiki is like that right um and i don't want to say that wikipedia is the only wiki in the world or the only kind of wiki it's really 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 not um it's it's not a great example of a wiki it's an okay example of a wiki it's not a great one there's lots of different kinds of wikis but um uh a wiki is is a way of working together that we haven't haven't done a very good job of over the last 500 years um, with maybe the exception of the Torah, which is kind of like a wiki. Um, uh, so kind of back to your question. Um, uh, I, I can actually kind of start with Wikipedia. So the idea of Wikipedia, kind of like you, like you said, you know, what are we trying to do? What should we try to do? What, what am I going to try to do? Or what is this team going to try to do? Um, the people that started Wikipedia said, hey, let's build an encyclopedia, but let's build it so anybody can click a button on the page and, and make changes and click save and, and we'll see what happens. Um, so um, I, I think it's kind of as simple as that. I, I, you know, you decide what you want to build. I want to build a, a collaborative knowledge base about soil health or um, about uh, uh, 1960s muscle cars or whatever you want to build a knowledge base around. And then you figure out what technology to use for it. And, and more importantly than the technology, what, tech, what does the technology enable that we can take advantage of in social ways? Um, so Jay kind of hit, you know, massive wiki has a get, a get, um, backend and that enables certain kinds of, it's actually, you know, that, that enables it, but that's not what, what we use. What we use is social conventions around the ways that we edit pages or who ed edits pages when, or how we edit pages together. And the, the tech technical layer underneath it is really important, but it's just an enabler for social activities. And then the social activity is coming to agreement on those, coming to agreement on what we're building and then coming to agreement on, you know, hey, when I swing the shovel this way, I think you need to make sure that your shovel is swung that way before I swing my shovel. Um, you end up doing a, a fair bit of that stuff um, early on. But at some point it becomes, all of that fades away and, and it becomes the building of the, you know, the, the thing. I, you asked it in an interesting way. Why are we talking about this, you know, um, in neobooks? So I think 
to answer that question kind of specifically, um, a, a core principle of neobooks is that they're written to, written collectively um, or written collaboratively, maybe. And we've said that we haven't we haven't really understood what we mean by that, and so we found ourselves in a in a discussion. Oh well, you know, let's write a collective neo book, and I'll write one chapter, and you write one chapter, and then it'll be a collective book, collectively written book. And others of us say, "Hey, <laughs> that's not collective authorship. That's uh, you know, serially or, or you know, simultaneously, you know, editing a a document or a, a book, but you didn't do anything collectively." So we're we're trying to figure out, you know, I think back to taxonomy. I think we're trying to to picture lots of different kinds of working together and um, I think it's fuzzing everybody's brain because we don't have a picture um, or a list somewhere of you know this is the wiki way to do it this is the you know the everything to way to do it this is the reddit way to do it um, this is the tiktok duo way to do it um, so having said that I I'm I'm I've got some energy to work on a taxonomy of collective authorship um, and um, that might be a fun thing to do in this, in, in one of these calls. Um, I think maybe we have too many people and maybe, maybe that's just a two or three person thing to at least set something up. Um, so, um, it would be fun to do that all together. It would be fun. I, I would volunteer to do a little bit of that for homework for next week, uh, with one or two people. So that's my offer. Um, thanks, Pete. Rick, off to you. Yeah, I'd just like to riff off of what Pete just said. I was going to say something else, but, uh, you know, what I liked about your idea is that our conversations are sort of are more theoretical. You know, there are different buckets. There's the tech bucket, there's the, uh, the neo bucket, and then there's the actual whatever people are going to do. Um, and you know, having a clearer purpose about what, why are you doing co-authoring, what degree of co-authoring, um, and, um, you know, what's the outcome? And one of the outcomes, I mean, uh, you know, what little I know of, um, of Klaus's book uh, and what little pieces I've seen of it is, well, how, you know, it, a nonfiction thing, and, and I don't know enough about your work, Klaus, to, to, to say what it is in terms of how it's used and what the outputs are, is one of the most important outputs is how can we use the technology more effectively to create ongoing learning communities and you know going off and reading a book by yourself is one thing but if you're actually using it um for creating learning communities then i think you would design them differently and i'll just throw a few ideas out um one is is where people are sharing their own personal stories about the work they're doing and that the purpose of the storytelling is to uh, engage other people and getting the reactions to the story of what's told, what they got out of it, and does it inspire them to tell their story? So storytelling, I think, is incredibly powerful. Uh, another category would be a more of a Socratic one, where you have something relatively brief, and it's actually designed to set up uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning. Uh, you know, one of the things about the email threads is that I can't keep up with them. You know, I've got so many other things and I pop in now and again. There's nothing There's nothing aggregating in a way that it's easy to come back to. Um, and, uh, you know, how can we use social media to actually use some of that huge wasted energy that people put into email threads and, and seeing whether you can have a better purpose? So to me, it's a question of of how do you create more of a, an ecological framework of learning, of transformational and collaborative learning. And, uh, you know, I think the technology is fantastic what we can do with it. But what I like to push the needle on is we're doing a lot of talking about it rather than doing it. So I really appreciate Pete's offer of doing that. Uh, I'm quite happy to add my two cents to it um, in whatever way would be helpful for what you're, you're thinking of doing. But I, I would, uh, you know, if, if, what I'd like to see happen is doing. So the doing would be whatever draft, you know, Pete is able to come up with, with whatever players, you know, that we, if, if we have time, we should look, really read it in advance and give some thought to it beforehand so that we can then enrich whatever, what Pete is doing. And to me, that's sort of modeling 
different levels of co-authoring from a core team to an outer team. And then people who are just readers who see something before the thing is published, who can provide a, a, a reader's perspective of what's going on. So anyway, food for thought. Um, Rick, thank you. I just want to reply to you for a sec before going to class. Uh, the reason, well, I think the reason we're having this slightly abstract conversation is that Pete and I, in one of our many conversations about how to do all this kind of stuff, uh, we're like, okay, okay, so we've got nuggets, and I, I'll just paste the nugget that exists in the world on the on the OGM wiki. There's a page called Nuggets Are Really Powerful. It exists in the world, and Pete and I were like, okay, how do we want, which of these many ways do we want anybody to interact with this nugget? Because the sooner we solve that problem, the more consistently we're, we'll be able to do it and use it going forward. So we, we kind of need to, that's why this, that's why today's topic is collective authoring, is that we actually hit the pragmatic question of, here's a nugget, how do we want people, do, what permissions do we want, what tools do we want, whatever. We ran into that immediately. Um, so I'm sorry if this sounds abstract, but but it, we, we, we bumped into it like you, like a ship running on a, a ground on a coral reef. It's like, oops, if we don't solve this, we don't get to sail the ship. Yeah, if I can just briefly, I, I'm, I, I, I really enjoy the abstract and the theoretical, the meta level thinking that goes into things. So I, I can get off on that. All I'm saying is, is that, I mean, it's critically important. So when you operationalize it, it's having the desired outcomes, whatever you think they should be. So I'm a hundred, but I'm just nudging, just, you know, uh, nudging us to move in the direction of being pragmatic, but I agree with you. The abstract is incredibly important, and it's often shortchanged. I get into these arguments with people about, you know, the doers and the thinkers of the world, and the doers tell the thinkers they don't know what to, do. they can't do anything, and the thinkers tell the doers you don't know what the hell you're doing. And to me, that dichotomous thinking is totally and utterly futile. And, and we get into these, you know, town gown arguments that are futile. Um, so I, I, I'm, this is not a criticism. This is just an observation about let's, let's, move, let's move in this direction and do something pragmatic. And then we can come back to the abstract and learn from it. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Klaus? Yeah. Um, so I sent around this frontline report on AI yesterday because I thought it was uh, uh, very rich in um, in uh, uh, summarizing, you know, where AI is, what it does, and and where uh, where it's heading. So let's take, for example, this uh, goal, right? The Google team that uh, won against the grandmaster of goal which is like an incredible feat. Um, and the uh, audience, millions of people, tens of millions of people watching this, never thought it was possible that the machine could outdo the grandmaster of gold. Well, it did. So how did this really happen? You had a team that programmed the AI to know as much as it needs to know to accomplish this. Now, if you go to the same AI and ask it later on uh, now, uh, how do you restore soil health? It has no idea, right? I mean, this this thing is highly specialized to beat uh, a Go master. It knows everything about Go. It knows nothing about anything else. So, so, the, so AI is very narrow. Right? It's very specialized in what it, it what it uh, what it knows. So, when you are inserting teams to edit, to write, you know, to contextualize, where do you insert it? After AI has produced text or before guiding it to produce the best possible text? So my uh, understanding is that the initiative and the energy needs to be in the coding, in the programming, in the teaching, in the guiding process of AI. So what else do you need to know in order to come up with a better answer. So anytime I'm interacting with AI and it produces something that is not satisfactory or it just doesn't make sense or it just seems to miss something, my impetus then is to go back and say, what else can I profit you with? What other information can I give you to come up with a richer context and a richer answer, right? So then 
when you do that, you end up with a with a chatbot that is very specialized. So in my case, my chatbot is highly specialized in understanding food and agriculture in the context of evolution, in the context of climate change, in the context of food security, in the context of culture, cultural impact, and all of those things. So it can produce intelligent answers to questions. So, 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 and, and, what companies are doing now, what where ChatGPT is going with this ChatGPT enterprise, is it give it's giving a tool to companies to insert their knowledge base you know, into a tool and then add on to this collectively as a team, add on to it, write the best possible uh, source, you know, feedstock for this AI to assist them then in executing or developing uh, strategy and outcomes and so on. So it's just, I think that's, a, it's just, you know, it, it's AI, AI forces us to think differently because at the end of the day, um, we can't compete with AI. And this is really also something that really hit me when I was watching this again, this frontline report, the Asians, now, with that Taoist belief system, have no problem of giving up and handing over, saying, "Yeah, we can't be as as smart as AI. It's just no way you can outthink AI. Given you know the same level of source information, it will outperform you." So they are turning. So so the Chinese and the Asians in general have fully embraced AI as a tool. They understand how it works. Because the 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 example that they got out of this go uh, exercise was pretty much I need to teach this thing, you know, to to think uh, in in very broad context, and then it will give me outputs that I couldn't do on my own. So, so different way of thinking. Um, a couple thoughts to what you just said, Klaus. The documentary you shared with us um, is from twenty nineteen. And uh, Alpha Zero and Alpha Go were 2017, 2016. And what's interesting is that you are completely accurate in saying that these were very narrow domains. They were playing the game of Go. Uh, and the, some of the big advances that have happened since then, the reason 2022 was such a big year, is that they're ganging together broader thinking context, uh, a collection of experts, cap capacities. They're actually able to run, you know, AG we don't have AGI yet. We don't have generalized intelligence, but boy, we made a big leap from the very, very narrow, narrowly capable tools from before. Um, also a, a second interesting thing, maybe AlphaGo was taught with thousands of Go games because Go has been played for many, many centuries and they had the best games of Go to teach it. Alpha Zero was just given the rules of Go. And because Go is 19 by 19 lines with black and white stones, and here's how you capture territory, it played itself until it got way better than Alpha Go, the version that only played human games. That's really interesting. That simulation is not, I don't think, possible in the real world, unless we were to take some new gen AI and just drop it into the world and say, here, go read, go read as much as you want to and get, you know, get smart by interacting. Or by interacting with, I don't, I don't know what that would look like, but that little experiment is not doable in practical, broad, real-world examples. But it means to me that these things are really capable of creativity in the sense of they don't have our own biases built in. And what we're doing with all these Gen AI large language models right now is we're feeding them all of human culture, which is full of biases. And then we're worried about, oh my gosh, the thing has biases in it. It's like, well, yeah, we gave it like what humans do. And we seem to be pretty biased. Anyway, all my, those things are... Yeah, my my point was, where do you insert a team to engage with AI, before or after, right? So my argument here is, you engage the team and this collective writing in the process of coding or or training the AI. What comes out of it, right? To rewrite this, I wouldn't rewrite it. I would rewrite what I have taught the AI if it is unsatisfactory. So that's the that that's the point I was trying to make here. Okay, thank you. And and I think you've raised a really interesting question, which is what is the role of AI at any stage in this process? And you know, how do we engineer what we're doing kind of to fit that, to take advantage of that? Um, Gil Jose Rick. 
Yeah, this is maybe off topic, but I can't resist responding to Klaus. Uh, I think, Klaus, what you're speaking about highlights some of the real challenges in how we're thinking about AI. Um, and Jerry, you clarified some of that with the AlphaGo and Alpha Zero and we're, we're at whatever we call now square root of zero or something. Um, the tendency is to think about programming and uh, treating AIs as like a massively, you know, it, like 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 a huge beyond imagination computation engine with instructions that it proceeds through. Uh, and that's very different than what we're seeing. And it's certainly not the way human beings work. Uh, and I've been finding that in the guys I've been working with on building some AIs on my side, where I see that their tendency is to try to distill a set of rules of human interaction. Like, you know, what does Gil characteristically say to a client in such and such a kind of circum circumstance, which can get at something but doesn't get at the heart of it, and certainly not at what intelligence is. Uh, the Go master isn't just a master of the rules in 10,000 games of Go, but she also had breakfast that morning. And she heard a poem the night before. And she went to a concert the week before. And that affects her play uh, in a way that no kind of code can get at. Um, and even the um, the alpha zero was simulating the whatever, you know, whatever the number of permutations that's possible there. Um, um, does that exhaust all possibilities for surprise and innovation and, and the something else that humans do so far seems to be dif distinct and different than what anything we construct can do. Um, even, you know, even the AIs of now are, you know, they're, they're still, as far as I can tell, they're still stochastic parrots. They're very big and very sophisticated and they produce what, is, what we around this house call simulated intelligence. We wouldn't call it artificial intelligence, but it produces something that feels like intelligence and is good enough for some purposes um, but is different than what we would characterize as intelligence. So um, that said, I'm not sure what all that, my comments to your comments and Klaus's provocation that started off, I'm not quite clear what that has to do with the NeoBooks project. Thanks, Gil. Can anyone tell me? Um, I don't know. Stuart, by the way, is uh, in the, at the Chinese embassy in San Francisco awaiting a visa. Hmm. That's why he's being quiet. He can he can chat in the chat, but uh, it's just listening in. Mm -hmm. So see if I may just respond. The Go entire ahead. NeoBook project is based on GPT interaction, right? Oh. So the, in the title it says written written with, you know, the prompted and edited by, Chat GPT four point That's the whole baseline here. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I think that's your book, right, Klaus? Is the way to say that. Um. So by the way, a, a thing that we've hit a couple times, and I want to say it real quick, I, I apologize, Jose and, and Rick, uh, neobooks and how you write neobooks, I think I, I think the, the neobook definition th doesn't strongly include it must be written collectively or it must be written by one person or it must be written by um, somebody talking with ChatGPT. I think that the neobook idea is kind of a general thing where there's nuggets and repurposing and things like that. And then there are ways to write neobooks. Um, and then even in ways to write neobooks, maybe you're using ChatGPT, maybe you're using, I don't know, a jazz soloist. The, the, in the collective authoring, um, uh, collective authoring to me, uh, means they're using a wiki, they're using a Google Doc, uh, they figured out how to do collective authorship uh, like uh, Gray Brown Wengro, and they're sending emails and probably drafts back and forth to each other in Microsoft Word or God knows what. So there's lots of different ways to do neobooks, I think, is, is one of my top line kind of things. Um, and Jerry kind of got us started on collective authoring because it seemed like an interesting topic from last last time, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not. Um, uh, but even collective authoring isn't the only way to write or, or chat GPT and, and you are, aren't only the only ways that you can write a new book. Thanks, Pete. I'll say then, Rick. Yeah, Pete, I agree with your plurality. Uh, Rick, can you wait, hold off a second? I'll say it was ahead of you. Um, no worries, Rick. Um, so at first, when I was listening to Klaus over the last couple of meetings, I, I felt like 
are we having the same meeting because Klaus is uh, focused on on AI. And I must admit that today I, I kind of um, flipped to, to Klaus's camp a bit. Um, I'm wondering that if if um, what Klaus is bringing to the table is is actually quite interesting. Um, are we looking at how we've been thinking of knowledge, the creation of it in writing and in documents, in um, books or whatever physical or, or virtual medium? Um, is that in itself uh, a, a something we're stuck on because that's the way we've thought of content of knowledge and that um, maybe Klaus is is trying to point us to something which is there's another way to think about what this information is and how it works and where it it fits um I find that a rather intriguing question because I maybe it's time for us to stop thinking about information as what I write or you write or somebody else writes or even how we write it together, but more about how do we um, how do we put it into a new format that uh, gives us a lot more than what we can been able to do ourselves. So that that to me is an interesting question. As to uh, the comments about um, you know Neobook is, collaborative or not collaborative or doing it this way or that way and this tool or that tool. I think, again, we're talking about the, the how. Um, and I wonder if, for example, what comes to mind for me is, is there a way to, to look at a model of what we want to write and or create? Um, and is, is that model, for example, starting with first principles that what we do is we change the way we think about what we're creating at the informational level not at the at the doing level and and then work from there at the informational level um, and then think okay well now how do we with this informational level how would we use the right tools to build it um and what, why is this informational level the one uh, uh, structure that the one that we want to use? So, still playing with with those things because I think there's a bunch of pieces here that we're playing with that are rather interesting. No answers, just questions. Thanks, the same. All right, go ahead, Pete. Um, did Rick get to go? Um, um, Oh, yes, actually, Rick was next in queue, and Gil is about to leave the call because he's got to go places. Uh, thanks. Rick, uh, go ahead if you want to. Yeah, that's fine. That's one thing about hiding your cameras. You don't know who, what turn you are, so that's the reason why I jumped in. Uh, the downside of using the hide feature. Uh, actually, yep. I'm interested in Gil's uh, before he leaves, and actually, um, and, and Klaus, actually. I, I had a dental appointment. This is sort of tangential but relevant. I, I was at the dentist this morning. While I was uh, there, I listened to a podcast uh, that was called um, The Next Economy Now and learned about uh, a woman by the name of Kate Taylor. Um, she and her husband have a foundation about uh, how to redesign banking for regenerative agriculture. And I learned from a colleague friend of mine who says the U USA is in a bit of a pickle because the number of farmers over 60 is quite significant who are retiring and young farmers can't afford to buy the uh the farms so the, it, it's prime picking for the uh you know the agro-industrial complex to sweep up these retiring farmers who who can't um you know they can't get buyers for it so i mean it comes back to food policy but i found this uh, um, podcast absolutely fascinating uh, I just wanted to put that on there. And if it's old hat for you guys, that's fine. But it was certainly new for me. So, um, and I, I just a, a final comment. I agree um, with you. Uh, we need a plurality. The question with the plurality, though, is you may have to have different first principles depending upon uh, different domains that you're working in. So, 
Um, thanks, Rick. I think several people recognize the person you were talking about as Cat Taylor of Tomcat Ranch and a bunch of other really interesting things around regenerative ag and such. Yeah, it was it was just, the podcast just came out and she was talking about uh, the recent developments that and again, if it's old hat, that's fine. But uh, for those of you who are behind this curve, which I am, it was highly informative. If you have uh, the title of the podcast or a link to the podcast, can, can drop that in the chat. That would be awesome. Thank you. I, I already put it in, actually. Oh, I'll scroll back. Uh, Pete, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, I I wonder one of the I I uh, I have a hypothesis. I think one of the problems that that we get uh, that we suffer from uh, with neobooks is that it is by nature kind of a meta project, um, and. So once we have one level of meta, it's it's easy to keep going kind of at other levels of meta. Um, if I may ground us a little bit, um, I think the NeoBooks project is the kind of Jerry's idea that uh, let's um, let's figure out. I'm, I'm going to say new, but new is not really the right thing. Let's figure out some different kinds of ways of um, knowledging in the world. Uh, so for centuries, we've been using this thing called books um, and maybe more recently magazines and novels and, and fiction, nonfiction. Um, so books have become <clears throat> both kind of a centralized and well-known way to do knowledge, um, uh, well-respected in lots of ways, uh, reviled in other ways. Um, and let's let's kind of try to break that mold a little bit. They're, they're useful and they're counter useful in some ways at this point. Um, uh, I remember, um, uh, I remember being in my headspace about wikis or something like that and, and uh, being on a trip and walking into a, a uh, bookstore, an airport bookstore and thinking, I get it. Books are where knowledge goes to die because it's like everybody writes stuff down and we print it all up and then we store it in these warehouses. And then at this point, uh, you know, like it's not, not a thing. They're, they don't live anymore. Um, and I'm, I'm over-exaggerating a little, but not too much. Um, so anyway, the idea of neo books, uh, Jose, to pick up kind of where you were, um, the idea of neo books has always been not to focus on the book part, but to focus maybe on the neo part um, and use book as a way to get some attention and to uh, talk a little bit about the gravitas around, you know, knowledge and information and things like that, but then free it from all of that with the neo part. And so, you know, sometimes a book is, uh, I, I don't know that we've talked about it in this space, but maybe we have. M maybe sometimes the knowledge comes out in a song. Uh, maybe sometimes the knowledge comes out, and I've certainly talked about this, maybe it comes out as a GPT, a chatbot that actually knows everything that you want to convey. Um, and the main interface to your knowledge uh, is some people walk up to it and they, they either type or they say, you know, um, tell me about soil health or tell me about uh, muscle cars. Uh, you know, why should I care about muscle cars? Um, uh, so the neobooks idea has always been multipolar, you know, representation of, of, of information. And then how do we form teams that work on quote unquote neobooks? Um, and the idea is uh, the neobooks project can help people who are streaming in going, I've got stuff I want to com convey or communicate or learn, um, help pe those people stream in and help them connect with uh, ways to do that. Um, one of the least interesting ones being publishing a book. One of the more interesting ones, maybe publishing a wiki. Maybe another more interesting one is setting up a forum uh, where you larder the, the forum with a lot of information and you pick a few of your closest friends who know about the topic and you know, maybe there's, there should be a soil health forum uh, that, that is a neo quote unquote neo book along with a GPT, along with um, a Kindle volume uh, co-written by Klaus and ChatGPT to let people know, hey, there's this thing called soil health, um, you know, and uh, even if you found it on Amazon, uh, you should still learn a lot about it. 
and maybe it will also kind of point you to more interactive ways to do it or more um, more rich ways of interaction interacting with with the knowledge that Klaus and ChatGPT kind of put together. So it's kind of like all of those things. Um, and and if you now go to go back to that, what I said was NeoBooks is kind of a colony of folks that are helping subject matter experts um, or subject matter inquirists, uh, people who want to know about subject matter. Um, NeoBooks is a project to help those people connect with modes of expression. So NeoBooks already is a meta-level thing where the idea of NeoBooks was never to be about one particular thing. It was about the way of using the, you know, using the techniques that we have, um, social techniques um, and informational techniques to help people publish if, if publish is even the right word because it's not really uh, interact and, and express and learn is probably, uh, those are probably better verbs than publish. Um, even though, you know, because we say book, we say publish. That's not the intent. Um, Pete, everything you just said plus a hundred from my perspective, I just like really appreciate the way you said that. Uh, I'll add one thing, which is, I don't think NeoBooks is meant to be about just learning and building knowledge together cooperatively and collaboratively. And we're talking here about how do we author collaboratively. Um, this is also about debate and conflict. And it's like, hey, someone else used this space to go tell us what their ideas are. And we disagree vehemently. How do we see that? How do we do that? How do we enter that space so that we can <clears throat> maybe figure out um, some middle ground or convince somebody or whatever else it might be? But it's not just about... <clears throat> how do we build the Encyclopedia Galactica together? Uh, it's more, how do we model the real uh, frustrating interactions that are happening online in a healthier, better way that slowly builds this knowledgey thing over time? Uh, whatever that sort of means. Uh, Dave, then Klaus. Yeah, thanks, Pete. You probably ought to like snip that and you know paste it to the website or something like that. That's a, that's a helpful description. And I guess I was trying to, like, I just, you know, kind of the horse I'm beating is I think pretty related in that it's like, okay, I want to do, I want there to be a specific thing in the world. I want landscape regeneration. So Klaus wants, you know, soil health. And I think we're going to need a lot of learning around landscape regeneration. So I want this open source stack of knowledge about landscape regeneration, um, which at first I had thought of as open. We just want open knowledge, but it turns out that's not really enough because it needs to be dynamic, right? It needs to capture the learning part. So the, the body of knowledge, the technology base or whatever we want to call it, has to keep improving. And, when, and ideally it's organized enough so that as it improves, you know, it's able to help the next group do their landscape regeneration, right? So it's, it's an acceler there's an acceleration function as part of this. So, you know, to, to me, what we're looking for is collaboration that enables the technology to dynamically improve. And we want to do it open so that it's not captured by capitalist interest. Thank God this is underlying, another underlying theme there. And which has kind of brought me around in you know, the last couple of months to say, oh, well, that means there needs to be, I'm calling it a business model, right? So the part of, I would argue, the Neo books problem is like, how do people work with each other is the, is the incentive problem. It's not a technology platform problem. It's an incentive problem. Like what? Well, the question is, why do they work with each other? You know, and if you look at why you write a book, you know, there's a set of reasons that an individual author would write a book, you know, none of which are probably make money unless you're really a, a rare author. Um, there are a bunch of other reasons. Why would I write a bunch of, why would I write a book with a bunch of other people, you know, needs, I think, a different mix of incentives. Um, and, and I think that personally, I think that's kind of the piece that we really haven't done a good job of cracking is trying to understand what these incentives look like that the shared contribution makes sense. Um, and so I, I don't know, I stuck in a link to complex reciprocity in the chat because I was Googling it as we were talking. And it's like, ooh, there's a whole field here that I know nothing about. But but, you know, in some sense, I think that's the problem we're trying to deal with is like, why, you know, what is it that's going to get us to kind of participate together? Then I do think things, there's design things like modularity that matter. And I also think that there's probably differences, like you, you basically need different, it's a multi-sided platform and you need different incentive structures for different people. You know, some people are going to want to make something pretty. And so you have to give them a way to make things pretty. And some people like to make sure the words are right. You let them edit and some people are going to, 
you know, want to add their own chapter. I don't know. So you're going to, you, you have to kind of structure the system that enables the people who have that incentive to participate in the way they want to participate. And I think that becomes a design problem. So, uh, business models. Um, Dave, thank you. It's interesting. Uh, the, the whole how do we reward people for participating or how do we motivate people for participating thing could eat a tremendous amount of our time. I will point out that there is no business model for Wikipedia, or maybe the Wikipedia is a public commons good where it's all donations fund the actual hardware or, and some people's actually staff time and all that kind of thing. But the vast, the majority of the people who did those uh, edits or Oxford commas or whatever were not getting any money and didn't didn't expect or want any money. No, or but they, they were incented. There was an incentive. Correct, but so it wasn't monetary. Had, so I'm using business model as a shortcut for yeah. resources are coming in and productively creating the system. Right. And yeah, they, they, some, for some reason, people are incentive, incented to participate. And I, I get the impression the whole, there's like a whole cohort of people are incented because they like to create structure and, and, you know, ding other people and shit, you know, I mean, it's Wikipedia, right? <laughs> totally get that. So, so Dave, um, way back when Clay Shirky talked about the plausible promise, and he said that when, when Linus Torvalds started Linux, his plausible promise was, hey, I really want Unix to run on my PC, which is kind of a wimpy machine. And when I'm done, it'll be under the GPL, which already exists. Therefore, anybody who helps will be able to use it. That was his plausible promise. And as soon as you say business model, my little radar goes up and I'm like, uh, and, but you, you mean, I think roughly what, what Clay meant back when about a plausible promise. And sometimes the plausible promise is you, there will be loop, there will be financial reward for you if you participate. And that's awesome. And I totally agree with that. Maybe, but I think maybe business model is still not a bad term because the the if if Torvald had finished writing Linux and thrown it over the wall and said, "Look, open Linux," and nobody had done anything else with it, it would have been open, but not matter. What made it matter is its continuing dynamism, right? Which is because of the business model, right? When when IBM decided they could put a billion dollars into Linux and save money, that was a business model decision. Totally so agree. the plausible promise, I think, is where we've been stuck for the last 15 years, but it isn't enough. So we need something more than that to, to generate the ongoing dynamism. And so Wikipedia, I'd say, has captured that. I mean, I don't know what its growth curve looks like and stuff, but it has it's sustainable and it, it keeps improving, I'd say. You know, Linux keeps improving. The foundation, if you look at it, has added, you know, hundreds of other packages, not the operating system, right? And and I don't know. Some of those must be um, must be surviving, and some must not. But I don't even know what that looks like. But anyway, I, I really do. You know, there's probably a better term than business model. I use it to be a little a little bit to be provocative. But I really think it's kind of true because it is that that creates the dynamism. Um, thank you, uh, Klaus. Then Pete. Yeah, one thing we don't want to lose track of is that. This is a fast moving field, right? While we started this NeoBook project, how long ago? Less than a year ago, right? The the ground has shifted, right? I mean, for, uh, uh, GPT 4.0 got released. Uh, then uh, OpenAI released GPTs. Now, all of a sudden, uh, you have thousands of uh, GPTs popping up with specialized content. Um, uh, and now uh, comes GPT Enterprise, <clears throat> and you you wonder where where is this thing really going? And so, <clears throat> what OpenAI uh, is providing here is a tool set uh, that you can use to customize for your very specific type of business and for and to assist you in solving very specific issues you're dealing with in your business. So one of the one of the most important uh, aspects of this really is that the skill set to program a GPT is one of the is the hottest thing emerging on the labor market. Uh, if you can go to an, and assist a company, to set up their GPT in ways that um, 
that port that broadens you know, their knowledge base and that activates an AI capacity within their specific field, that is an amazing asset. And so, because, I mean, I, I'm seeing it right now because I'm working with some companies and I can, within an hour, it's, it's like, uh, David, within an hour, I could lay out a ground plan for you, you know, on how to capitalize on your project and and how and give you a business plan you know and the 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 there is also um a commercialization evolving where you take a gpt you develop it and you put a, a user interface on for at the front of it now you can take subscription services for your interface you can charge based on time based on membership whatever and uh, and you can capitalize on this. And this, these are things that are happening as we speak. So then the question comes, so so you know, um, how do you how do you swim with this? Because this is this is out and running. You know, and and as I always compare like to compare it to when Excel spreadsheet came out, right? When Excel spreadsheet came out, at first the accounting profession was, oh my God, you know, I'm losing my job. Is is gonna? This is gonna uh, uh, no, un get get us unemployed, and indeed, you know, the the typical accounting work shifted dramatically. But then somebody discovered, hey, I can play a what if game with this thing, and it changed the nature of accounting. You know, so now you have AI is the same thing. People are starting to figure out what you can do with this thing, and the first reaction was paralysis. Oh my God. Our jobs are going away, and then all of a sudden you realize you can do things with this that are requiring an entirely different skill set. Uh, and if you embrace that skill set, you can go out and just be on top of dive again. Right? So it, it just just uh, a, a different way of thinking. And David, I, I think there's a snowball chance in hell you could compete with someone, you know, with with your project who is using AI. You couldn't. It would outperform you. It would outrace you in no time. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, you, you may be right. I, I guess I, I'm assuming that AI is also the sp a spreadsheet, right? I mean, so if you were to say to what you're, if what you're saying to me is, you can go to AI and tell me how to do landscape regeneration anywhere in the world, and the answer will pop out. I think I'm no, bullshit. Not that's right? not what I'm saying. That's, that's what not... the technology needs to do. So that's what we need to have happen. So we'll use AI to get to that point, right? But we don't have the data that we need. We don't have the algorithms. They, they don't exist, right? But they will exist over the next 30, 40, 50 years, right? And AI will be embedded in there. It'll help us search and things like that. But what we want is a collaborative process of creating that, right? Which I think humanity is still going to participate in. So... I mean, I, I assume you're right in that, you know, we'll increasingly see AI as the front end to the body of knowledge that will be developed either by people or machines. And that data will be used then on the ground to implement change that, you know, restores landscapes. But it's not a magical process that you could do now with chess, with GPC-4. I mean, we're, David, we're decades away. Anything you need to know about landscape and landscape rejuvenation is known. It's in the library. It's on the science. It's right there. I mean, what is it that you would want to know that is not known? I mean, what, give me an example. Uh, hydrological models of water supply in Playa Viva. And they are not known? And how they can be influenced. Yeah, nobody's written those. That's totally they don't known. exist. But, but, you, but you know the science, you know the physics. No, that's been argued about too. Okay, I, I offer you a one-hour work I mean, session. Saying, no, I offer you don't. a one-hour work session. <laughs> I don't want it. But but you can tell. Yeah, me you don't. Why, why, you know, oh, come on. Yeah. Hold on, hold on one second. There's there's an interesting philosophical question that LLMs raise, which is: Do LLMs obsolete note taking, writing, uh, collaboration among humans, and all that? Because the future holds. We're just going. This thing is going to be eating information faster than any human possibly could. It's going exactly. to know the answers better than any human possibly could, and we're just going to be interacting with this thing. This 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 conversational beast over time and that's it right and i don't i don't buy that future and i think that pieces of that will show up but i don't buy that future at this moment at all and i'm trying to figure out 
how do we use AI extremely sagely in the process of, as humans, curating what we know? And what is the meeting ground of human curated knowledge with AI generated or curated knowledge? And how does that even work? But I don't buy that writing has been obsoleted. I, I saw a couple of, of posts early on. Hey, forget about note taking. This whole tools for thinking sector, it's screwed. LLMs have just destroyed human note taking because there's just no reason to continue taking notes. These AIs are going to know, know better everything. And I'm like, no, nah. I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not drinking that Kool-Aid. Um, and, and I can, I, and I think that having a debate about that might be a thing we could do on a call here, except I just made a mistake picking collaborative authoring on this call as a topic. So I don't, I don't want to jump on that real quick, but, but, but it's a really legit, interesting question. And I'm, I'm very interested in what are the wisest ways of using these new AIs, which I think are phenomenal. Klaus, the reason I said that was 2019, this is now, is that they've really leaped forward. There have been, been a whole bunch of very interesting uh, advances and there will be more because now we can even use the AI to improve the AI. It's crazy. Sing singularity, anyone? We haven't even said that word here. Anyway, <laughs> that's right. any, anyway, I wanted, I wanted to just bubble up a little bit and say there's a philosophical question here that's important to our quest. Um, I'm very much on the part of how do humans author stuff together, occasionally using AI really well. But I'm not interested in, in like having AI author my particular text. I've got a bunch of ideas I want to line up in a row and put into the world and see what happens. Um, Pete, then Jose, and then we're about at time. Um, I have a lot to say about AI pro and con in other venues. Um, and for me, the other venues are places to talk about the, the pros and cons. Um, uh, I will say uh, that we're not to the point where AIs have meaning or knowledge. AIs, the way, the way I like to say it, and, and then I always kind of contradict myself when I give somebody some advice, but the way I like to say it is... Uh, AIs are really good at slicing and dicing um, language. Lots of knowledge is expressed in language. So AIs by proxy are good at slicing and dicing, you know, language-based knowledge. Um, still and all, when you get something back from a chatbot, unless you read through it and ensure that it makes sense and ensure that it's meaningful to your audience, you just got a steaming pile of crap. Um, uh, so, uh, um, Bill Anderson is, has a, and I forget the, the person's name, but he's got a ph philosopher that, um, uh, he likes what she says about AI and it's something like, um, uh, AIs don't make meaning, people make meaning. The AI is, you know, the output of an AI doesn't mean anything. Um, it's until somebody has gone through it and said, I agree with everything, or I agree with 80% of this, I'm going to change, you know. 20% and add some stuff. Um, uh, so um, not so interested about AI discussion here, much more interested like Jerry kind of, I think about uh, how do we collaborate and how do we up-level our sharing of, of information and knowledge and thought. And, and, and I, uh, I, I really love Jerry, you said something like sometimes it's one person. Um, uh, sharing stuff it doesn't have to be every you know a, a collaboration. Um, I wanted to get back to Dave David where he said uh, business model, and then the, a couple of words after that was incentive. And so um, I kind of Dave, I kind of disagree with your need for going back to business model. I really liked when we ended up with an incentive model. Um, so this to come back to where I started actually this, this call, uh, incentive models is how you drive shared goals. Um, so one incentive model is I work on this because I get paid by my boss. Another incentive model is I want everybody in the world to know about uh, 1963 muscle cars and there's three other people in the world who will help me. So we have a shared incentive. Um, even out to Wikipedia, um, uh, Jerry, you're right. Wikipedia doesn't have a particular, it kind of does have the, Wiki, the Wikimedia Foundation has a business model. Wikipedia doesn't really have a business model, but it certainly has an incentive model. Um, there's lots of incentives to, um, to create with Wikipedia and that's the thing to look at. So um, when I, th I think when David says something like, or any of us say something like business model, if I'm going to keep translating that to incentive model in my brain, because then it takes out the, the weird money thing. 
and lets you look at other stuff like like david said um some people like to beat pe other people up on wikipedia and that's their incentive um uh hearts clubs diamonds spades um the um the essay by bartle um uh so uh so thanks david for for leveling me up from oh all we have to do is come to a shared set of goals and and really what we need to do is understand incentive models and work with different people who are incentivized by different things um sometimes by money but often not um and that's where we get that the ability to do shared goals and the only thing i got to say there is i think they're often incentivized by money so I mean, I feel like we yeah, can't write and, that and part off. Yes, yes, and, 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 and the success um, of something like Linux is a financial story, right? There, there is a I, I financial think, argument yes, for why. I think Linux yes works. and no. Your your points are well taken, and and the fact that IBM or something, it's it's funny when, <laughs> I I never want to disagree with you, David. Um, by the way, um, but. Uh, it's great that that big companies poured billions of dollars into Linux, but uh, op there's a lot of open source that's not incentivized by money. And I think Linux didn't succeed because it it, it had money pouring in. It helped a lot, and it got in, in many more places. There's a, a an opposite incentive, which a lot of open source gets taken advantage of because it saves somebody money. Um, so there's some like horrific stories where there's some critical piece of internet infrastructure that's maintained by one guy um, starving to death in Eastern Europe someplace. And all he wants is, you know, all he wants is to be able to eat and, and sleep in a, in a warm place. And then he would be covered, but everybody else is like, well, I guess I will just use this for free. So there's the opposite side of that too. But there's a lot of, I, a lot of open source is just, um, hey, if we share, share alike, we get more out of it. Um, so there's as much of that energy and dynamism uh, in open source as there is, you know, money from corporate sponsors. So, um, I'll point out a the... very interesting discussion, and I think incentive models are really key to the neobooks conversation, just because we need that um, shared goals thing. Totally agree. Um, the internet incentive model was how do we avoid our communication network being taken down by Russian bombs? There was, and there were a whole bunch of contractors who wanted to make a lot of money from it, but. The, 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 when the internet was born, it was competing against the advanced intelligent network, which is what all the for-profit telcos were trying to build so that they could make a lot of money shipping all this cool new video and other kinds of stuff around. That advanced network got eaten by this weirdo protocol called the internet. It just basically like ate its brain like cordyceps, um, which I find really interesting. So I think so that, that the, the DARPA ahead. money and, and incentive transferred into academic people and civic-minded people. Right. Um, so that was the next evolution of the internet. Um, people like John Postel and a bunch of people, you know, uh, um, professors and, the, and students and things just trying to get stuff done together and uh, for the better of the world. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Jose? I just wanted to uh, throw my hat in the ring there with uh, Pete on, uh, on working on something for next week. For the taxonomy? We'll figure out what it is. Sounds great. Um, can we have that conversation on the Mattermost channel for this call? Um, and I'm uh, Pete, you're muted. I created a taxonomy uh, wiki page already. Yeah, the I document think the thing to is do in is, the chat. Uh, is to collaborate asynchronously through the Mattermost chat. Um, and if you're not doing Mattermost chat or you can't figure out the wiki, just send me an email or, or something. Yeah. If you think I can add value, Pete, I would also join. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. And me too, obviously. Um, cool. Uh, so we're going to do that in between. Shall we re report in on that next week? Will that be the start of our call? See what we what progress we make on that, and then see where that takes us. Uh, one, that should be one of the chicken things. Yeah. Cool. I don't know when that call is, uh, uh, if you could send me a note. Oh, uh, next Monday, just the next call in this sequence. Just the Neobooks call. The next Neobooks call. So there's no extra meeting between now and then. I think we should do it async. Yeah. At least try. Yeah. So the next one is the Monday the 12th. Just so the first now. step is look at this web page and tell me how it sucks. Cool.
And and if anybody wants to edit the wiki with uh, Obsidian, um, I'd be happy to show you. And if you go down to the bottom of the page, you'll find a link. So you, if you wanted to use a line-oriented editor on GitHub and you have a GitHub account, you could edit the page directly <laughs> with the link that's currently by default at the bottom of that page. But that's kind of the hard way around. But it does work, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Which is which is one of the reasons Pete and I decided this was an interesting topic. Or ever software challenged. <laughs> um, all right. That seems like a good place to, to wrap this call. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, all. Thanks. Fun navigating these rapids with you all. Yeah.